Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. I hope you're excited for today's story. The story today is about the Superstition Mountains and about when me and my friend Abdullah went to go search for the Lost Dutchman's treasure. If you support this channel and you want as many stories as you could possibly handle, I deeply encourage you to hit the like button. If you've never hit the like button on YouTube in your life, let today be the first time you do it. Also hit subscribe and hit the notification bell. I deeply appreciate your support and the best thing that you could possibly do for this channel to get as many stories as you could possibly handle is click the join button below. If you've been following my channel for a while, you know that me and my friends really enjoy the great outdoors. If it's the forests of Michigan, the Appalachian Trail, or even the Smoky Mountains, we always try to make time for a good adventure. We usually tend to stick to the more woodsy areas, but in 2020, during the middle of the lockdowns, my friend Abdullah and I decided to go on a trip to Arizona. We had been so cooped up that we figured that spending a weekend away in the wilderness, away from all of the craziness, was the best thing for our mental health at the time. We had already lived together, so getting in the car and driving to Arizona and walking around in the wilderness wasn't a risk to anybody. If anything, it was the most responsible thing we could do. And me and my buddies do this thing that whenever we go on trips, we try to find something mysterious and interesting about the location. If it's a spooky backstory or a myth of the region, we act like we're pursuing whatever the myth is like as a bit. It just makes it more fun because if you're just hiking, the hike could be mad boring. But if you spend the entire hike pretending to be finding clues of like the holy grail, the downtime on the hike is far more entertaining. Guys, I know it's silly. It's just a bit that me and my friends do. But with that being said, when we looked up myths and superstitions in Arizona, it just so happens they have an entire mountain range named after it. So naturally, we decide to hike the Superstition Mountains. And if you don't know about the Superstition Mountains, it is said that in the late 1800s, there was a prospector named Jacob Waltz that supposedly found a gold mine. And this gold mine had enough gold to make a man unimaginably rich. He claimed to know the location of it, but passed away before revealing it to anybody or claiming any gold for himself. And that mine is now known as the Lost Dutchman's Gold Mine. One funny thing is that they call it the Lost Dutchman because the people in America didn't know the difference between Dutch people and Germans, but he was actually German. Anyway, it's the Lost Dutchman's Mine. And before his death, he hinted that it was located in the Superstition Mountains, right near the Weaver's Needle. Weaver's Needle is a thousand foot high column of rock that forms a distinctive peak visible for many miles. So naturally, being the dorks that we are, we chose to do the Weaver's Needle Trail that's about 13 miles long. You could get it done in two days, but we plan to linger out there for three. Listen guys, it's not the most difficult hike in the world, but you need to bring copious amounts of water with you, especially when you go in the summer like we did. We were so excited because it was the first time out of our houses in months, and we had a great bit to do the entire time. This weekend, we're treasure hunters, baby. We even looked up silly hand-drawn maps and silly riddles that were available online so we could pretend to do a solve once we got to Weaver's Needle. We had actually gotten that idea from my buddy Sam, who actually went hunting for Forest Fence treasure while he was in college at Colorado State. But that's a story for a completely different time. So we packed up Abdullah's Nissan Altima with enough water and food to keep a horse alive and one big tent that we planned on sharing. I was going to carry the water and he was going to carry the food. And we were going to split the tent between our packs. And of course, all the basic survival gear like flashlights, binoculars, and basic tools. This trip just had an extra bit of excitement around it. The world was going crazy at the time, so we felt like we were finally normal again. When we finally arrived, I was actually shocked with how empty it was. We expected that a ton of other people would have the exact same idea as us, but I guess nobody else was ready to leave their house yet, so we had this mountain all to ourselves. There was only one car in the parking lot other than ours when we arrived, and as we were unpacking our stuff, a park guide came up to the car and introduced himself. He was super friendly, and he actually actually seemed really excited that there were people here. It must be really boring to be out here with no people showing up every day. And for us, it was nice just talking to a stranger because we lived in the city at the time where everybody was avoiding each other by six feet and being super antisocial. So we were just chopping it up with this guy and we legitimately started hitting it off with this dude. He was only a few years older than us and he actually grew up in Phoenix and he was into all the same stuff that we were into, all the sports, everything. And we found ourselves talking to this guy for almost 30 minutes after we had finished unloading the car. He was being super helpful giving us tips on what we should look out for and what views we have to go see, the ones that we cannot miss. He was just an overall good dude. And he started jokingly complaining that he was jealous that we got to go out that day and that he was going to have to be stuck in the guide's cabin in the parking lot. And we started asking him, why doesn't he just go out? Because there's nobody here. And he explained that he's technically on the clock and he can't go out unless he's hired as a guide in case anybody shows up and is looking to hire a guide. So me and Abdullah just ask him what his rate is and tell him that we would be happy if he would tag along with us. We hadn't seen any other human 
humans in so long that we were just craving social interaction. And I mean it, we genuinely wanted him to come with. Me and Abdullah are both very curious people. And in the 30 minutes we had talked to him, he had already taught us so many cool things about this mountain range. So we both agreed he would enhance this trip significantly. Plus he's cool and he don't even feel like a guide. He feels like he could be one of the boys. He immediately resists because he's a good guy and doesn't want to intrude on our trip. So we start pressuring him and trying to force money into his hand as a joke. And we pressured him enough that he could tell that we really meant it. And we really wanted him to come with us. This wasn't just a pity invite. So he finally obliged, but he insisted that this tour was on the house. We just had to scan our IDs and sign off that he was coming with us. So all of his bases were covered and he could enjoy the wilderness with us that day. We like to be spontaneous and the addition of a knowledgeable guide just enhanced this trip significantly. So the guide just quickly throws together a pack for himself and lets us know that he really appreciates this. And he says that he's only going to come out with us for today. Then he wants us to enjoy the rest of the weekend alone. That seemed fair to us, so we got to hiking. So I'm going to give you a little bit of insight on a couple of the clues that the lost Dutchman left about his mind. So you understand the jokes that we were making on this hike. This is a super rudimentary breakdown of the clues that we were able to find. There's much more extensive clues on the location of the mine if you want to look them up for yourself. But remember, we were doing this as a bit, so we just held on to the simplest ones. The first clue is that the mine is located off of a trail that heads north into the Superstition Mountains. The second one is that you'll pass a stone cabin on the way to the mine. The third one is that at a certain point, there's going to be a trick in the trail, meaning at one point in the trail, it splits into two directions, and the direction that looks less likely to be the right way is probably the right way. Fourth, you'll pass a stone wall that has carvings on it that was apparently carved in by Apache tribes. And in the carvings, it depicts a man. Fifth, you're able to see two large columns of rock from the entrance of the mine. The sixth one is that there's an arch of stone that's almost shaped like an eye. And if you stand in the middle of the arch, you should be able to see the mine. And if you turn the opposite direction, you should be able to see Weaver's Needle from inside the arch. It wasn't even 10 minutes into our hike when me and Abdullah started joking about keeping an eye out for that stone cabin. Hey guys, this big handsome guy right here is named Apollo. See, Apollo here is the best boy in the world, so he gets treated as such. My guy takes showers in the human showers, relaxes on human couches, and most importantly, eats human grade food. Sundays, human grade dog food. And listen, ever since we found Sundays, it's been an absolute game changer. On New Year's Eve, me and the missus made the decision that we're standing on business all of 2024. Not only with work, but with our family's health. And you know, if we're making healthy changes, Apollo is too. We can't let our handsome man feel left out of all the fun. It absolutely warms my heart to see Apollo get as excited for his food as he does for his treats. And that only started when we switched to Sunday. He loves this stuff and I know that it's so much better for him than what we were feeding him before. But the best part about Sunday is actually in the convenience of it. They ship these nice compact boxes to your house every month. So you don't have to go lug a 75 pound bag of dog food out of the store. And not to mention the storage once it's in the house. This box is so compact that we keep it stored near our cereal instead of a massive bag just sitting in the corner of your kitchen with no good way to keep it closed. Guys, I know you have a handsome boy at home like I do that deserves to be treated like a prince. So right now you could score 50% off on your first order at sundaysfordogs.com slash Dougie or use code Dougie at checkout. Do you like Sundays? You love Sundays. And the guide immediately starts joking back, please don't tell me that you guys are treasure hunters. I really wanted to like you. As if he was so sick of wannabe treasure hunters coming into his mountains. We had a good laugh about it and we explained to him that we like to do themed trips and we weren't even remotely serious about looking for this mine. He got the joke and he actually started telling us interesting information about the gold mine. He told us that people have been bringing large amounts of gold out of this mountain range since the early 1800s. The main one being Jacob Waltz, also known as the Dutchman, but the people prior to Jacob Waltz had unimaginable stories. Some reporting that the mine is actually guarded by the Apache tribe. The only reason one guy was allowed to go to it was because he healed multiple Apache tribe members of eye disease, and they rewarded him by bringing him to the mine blindfolded and letting him take as much gold as he could carry before blindfolding holding him and taking him away. He had no idea of the exact location. Others reported that when they felt like that they were getting close to the mine, somebody would shoot warning shots at them as if there was a sniper watching over it. And some early explorers even consider the mountain range haunted with how many people went missing in search for gold. Not to mention how many people went mad looking for gold, including a man named Alicia Rivas, who moved into the mountain range and went crazy with his obsession of finding the riches of the Dutchman's mine. This guy was so crazy that even the Apaches left him alone. Me and Abdullah were absolutely right. Inviting this guy was a great choice. It made the adventure feel like a walk through history. 
And obviously, as you continue to hike, the talking dies down a little bit because it's summertime in the Arizona desert and fatigue starts setting in. We had been hiking for about two hours when we entered this particular area on the trail where there's two beautiful stone walls on either side of us. The entire trail is only about 25 feet wide at this point. We had already passed a couple of these, and when we entered passageways like this, it was such a relief because they were nice and cool. They provided shade that you couldn't find anywhere else in the desert. So we lingered a little bit in this gap of the trail, but the difference between this one and the ones prior was on the right side of the trail built against one of the walls. It looked like there was some type of structure that could potentially be the stone cabin that the Dutchman referred to in his clues. So naturally, me and Abdullah immediately run up to this thing, and we're pointing at it and celebrating that we found the first clue, because this is the fun of the bit. We get to find something and celebrate while we're in the middle of the hike. We're dancing around it, pointing at it, what's basically a pile of rocks. This thing barely looks like it could have been at the base of a stone house, but we're acting as if we're on our way to finding a gold mine. As we're trying to get the guide involved in our celebration, I notice that he's looking up above this passageway, towards the ledge of the top of this wall, and it's about 20 feet overhead. I look up above me, and then I look back at him. I'm really confused about what he's looking at. As I look back at him, I hear something coming from directly above us. It sounds like something's rolling, so I step away from the wall a little bit, and I look straight up. But from where I'm standing, there isn't much shade, so the sun's directly in my eyes. So I'm trying to look through my fingers to see what's above us, when all of a sudden something blocks out the sunlight. And in that moment, I realize that we're about to get caught in a rock slide, because there's a massive boulder shaped like an egg falling towards us. Luckily, Abdullah was looking straight up as well, and all three of us scatter and avoid getting hit by this thing. As this thing was free-falling, it caught an edge of the wall. This edge slightly protrudes out of the wall above the stone cabin. The collision between the protrusion in the wall and the boulder caused the boulder to split in half and the protrusion to be removed from the wall. It almost looked like when a chunk of an iceberg falls off and you could see the bright blue interior of the iceberg shining through. Me and Abdullah were absolutely shook because we were standing directly under where that boulder fell and we narrowly escaped being flattened by it. The guide didn't seem shook. He actually seemed angry and was still trying to get a good look at what was above the wall. We started asking him if we should get out of it because we're assuming that this is a rock slide and if it happened once it could happen again but when the guy took out his pistol and started pointing it towards the ledge it clicked in my head that he must have seen somebody and he thinks that somebody pushed it in an attempt to hit us immediately when a weapon is drawn the situation gets incredibly intense and there's not much room for words or conversations because you don't want to distract the guy that felt like he had a serious reason to take out his weapon so we just get behind him because if he has to unload that weapon we don't want to be downrange to get in his way even though he was pointing directly at the sky it seemed like the right Thing to do in case any other boulders came falling off that ledge as well. What must have only been a 30 second standoff, it felt like several minutes. But eventually the guide holstered his weapon and signaled to us to jog out of the pathway with him. But during those several minutes, me and Abdullah both noticed that the point in the wall where the protrusion cracked off was glimmering. There were bright gold chunks inside of that protrusion that were clearly shining. It wasn't like a rich gold ore, but it was clear that there was gold laced throughout this entire wall. We obviously can't mention it or draw attention to it while there's a gun drawn and suspicions around of an attempted attacker. But once we were out of the passageway, the first thing that Abdullah says is exactly what I was thinking. He just says, dude, should we go back? And the guide immediately says, what are you talking about? We absolutely cannot go back in there. So I butt in, assuming that he must have not seen the gold shimmering on the wall. I just say, dude, did you, did you not see what was inside that wall? And the guide replies, seeing fool's gold is not a good sign in these mountains. My spider senses immediately go off, and I start to think that this guide is starting to play reverse psychology on us. He's trying to downplay what we just saw, so we'll move on from it, while he knows the location of it. He must have seen the skepticism on my face, because he followed up by saying, dude, you don't really think that's the gold mine, do you? And Abdullah replies with exactly what I was thinking again. No, there was barely any gold in there, but it must mean that we're close. And just in that moment, what started off as a complete joke, just a running bit between a couple of friends, became very, very real. The guide has clear concern in his face, but I'm still not completely sure it's genuine. He puts both of his hands up and takes a deep breath before saying, listen guys, that boulder falling was not a coincidence. Whoever or whatever pushed that over the ledge wanted you to see what was in that wall. I immediately feel my bullshit alarms going off because there was not one car in the parking lot when we got here. And he even said that nobody had been in these mountains for weeks. So I asked the obvious question, yo, did you see anybody up there? And he just shakes his head no and continues walking away from the passageway, giving us no further explanation about what he saw or what he just said. Luckily, me and Abdullah are on the same page and we catch up to him and we start pressing 
addressing them. But he puts a halt to the conversation and firmly says, there's a rest point about one mile further. I'll explain everything to you there. And one mile isn't too far. And since we're staying on the same trail, it would be super easy for us to backtrack if we needed to. So we decided to play ball and follow him to the rest point. But the dynamic of the situation was so different now. It started off so fun loving and adventurous and playful, but now there was an odd tension between us and the guide. It wasn't nearly enough to have a confrontation, but it was enough for me and Abdullah to stay quiet and shoot skeptical looks at each other about him. We just started following along, but at this point we had been out there for a few hours and we were really starting to feel the heat. See, most people hike this trail in October, but we decided to come out here in August where it's damn near 100 degrees. So the fatigue's really starting to set in, but there's only a few hours left of daylight and we're about to stop at a resting point. So we just white knuckle it and tough it out until we get there. The resting point was a nice shaded area that had rocks that we could sit on and flowing water nearby where we could refill our canteens. And a bonus was that there was no ledge above us where a boulder could be dropped on our heads. We're still being quiet and not chatting much when the guide makes a gesture that kind of comes off as a peace offering. He asks us for our canteens for him to go refill them in the stream nearby. We like that idea because it's going to give us a moment to talk alone while he's over there filling the canteens by the stream. And right when he's outside of earshot, Abdullah goes, bro, I got a game plan. I think he's going to suggest turning back right now, but I don't really think that's a good idea considering the guide had our canteens. But this man said something genius. He says, whatever the guide's explanation is, when he comes back, we just play along with it. Make him think that we believe it and we're eating it up. And me and you go back to jokingly looking for clues. So he thinks we're all on the same page and we're right back to where we were before. But we could still get him to inspect clues in honor of the bit that we were doing earlier. I love this idea because it releases the tension of the group, but it still allows us to pursue the gold mine that we had just found evidence of with zero pushback from the guide that wants to keep it all to himself. Plus, he's only going to be with us until tomorrow morning. So we just got to wait this guy out. So we might as well convince him that we believe the lies that he's peddling. So he'll feel comfortable enough to head back and give us two full days to actually find it. We're fully on the same page and we're ready to hear him out when he comes back to the rest area. The first thing that he says is to drink this water sparingly because the stream wasn't really flowing heavily. So the water might be scarce for the next couple days or until we could at least get to the next resting point. See, that's advice I was willing to take seriously because dehydration is no joke. So I only take a couple sips of my water before storing it into my backpack. So it stays nice and cool and doesn't get lukewarm and gross. The guide's just pacing for a few moments like he's trying to gather his thoughts. And me and Abdullah are just sitting there waiting patiently for him to start talking. For us to execute our plan of fake understanding and obedience. And he starts off trying to butter us up. Starting to talk about how much he likes us and how good of guys he thinks we are. But I could tell he's ready to start talking about something serious when he sits directly across from us on another rock. And he says, I've seen and heard about too many cases of people going missing in these mountains. Searching for this gold. I'm begging you guys not to become one of them. What you guys saw in that wall is fool's gold. It's just a mineral called pyrite and it holds little to no value. And it sure as hell isn't the sign that you're close to the mine. And me and Abdullah start giving him the understanding knots, trying to sell to him that we believe him, but then he continues. Guys, there's hundreds of cases of missing persons in these mountains, and they all have various causes of death, from dehydration to falling off cliffs, and in some cases, even more than you'd imagine, they find skeletons with their skulls almost a mile away. And for serious groups of treasure hunters, the most common is gunshot wounds from close range from behind, almost as if somebody that they trusted did it to them. And the only common denominator in every case where there's a survivor to tell the story is that they came across fool's gold. Guys, these mountains have a weird way of about them. Like they mean no harm to the individual that's just seeking the natural beauty about them. But they're ruthless to those that are searching for something that is not theirs. I've seen things in these mountains that I cannot explain, and I refuse to let you two become its next victims. So I need you to promise me that we're here just to have a good time, and you'll forget about that fool's gold. Me and Abdullah are putting on our best poker faces, just agreeing with every word that he says. But we know for sure that this guy just doesn't want to split it three ways. So we make our promises and we make our amends, and I wait for the right moment to crack the first joke. I just say, we could still joke about it, right? And the guide laughingly replies, yes, we could keep doing the bit, before he slaps his thigh and stands up. He just goes, well, we gotta keep moving so we can get to Weaver's Needle before sundown. We let him lead the way and me and Abdullah trail behind him a little bit, so we have the freedom to keep our eyes wandering for clues. And we're also out of his earshot just in case we need to whisper. We spend the next stretch of the hike with our heads on a swivel, trying to find any landmarks that resemble any of the clues. We're not talking much because this stretch of the hike has a slight incline. And to be honest, it was starting to get very difficult. Difficult to the point where I start losing interest in the clues and the gold. And I'm just trying to keep one foot in front of the other. It's only about an hour from sunset when we take a quick stop in some shade. And I finally look up from my feet after spending a half hour just staring at my feet in the ground. And I see two very distinct rock formations 
formations to the left of the trail. They look like a two-pronged fork sticking out of the top of a hill. I was looking at them for a few moments and then I realized why they drew my attention. There's two columns that could be seen from the entrance of my mind. And these are two distinctly protruding vertical columns of rock. I take a moment to gather myself before I draw attention to it, just to make sure I have the right energy when I say it. I'm mulling over if I should act kind of excited or really excited. I came to the conclusion that I should act really excited like I did when we found the stone cabin. I wanted to be over the top to make it seem like we were going back to doing the bit. So I start hopping up and down and hitting Abdullah on the shoulder while I'm pointing at the columns like I'm an excited ape trying to communicate with the human. While I'm jumping up and down, I'm fading towards that side of the trail. And I notice that there's a trail split right here, but the trail that's going Going towards the columns, it's not nearly as prominent as the main trail. And in my head, we just found the trick of the trail that leads towards the column on the hill. But I don't draw any attention to that. I try to feed into the bit by asking the guide if he could take us off trail. Just take us to the top of that hill so we could take pictures with those protruding columns. I felt like the touristy aspect of taking Instagram pics would persuade him and it did. He was very amused by the way I was jumping around. And he said, it seems to be only about a 15 minute detour. So if we really wanted to go up there, he'd be happy to take us. We let him lead the way again and I start nudging Abdullah with my elbow and I'm shooting my eyes towards the ground so he'll notice the faint trail and I could see it in his eyes when it registered and he gave me an excited shove on the shoulder and he whispered it's the trick of the trail this just further reassured us that the gold in that wall was legit and we might actually find this thing because it's not like the second rest area was an established rest area there was just a little bit of shade and a faint trail off to the left if it wasn't so hot, we never would have stopped at it. But now we had to figure out how we were going to buy time at the top of this mountain to give us time to find the next clue. We were both so excited, so we started picking up the pace of our hiking. And the guide picked up his pace because he didn't want this detour to be too long. So when we got to the top, I finally realized that this heat is actually hitting me kind of hard. And I've been way too sparing with my water. Because once we got to the peak of this hill and I started taking in the panoramic view of the landscape, I got a wave of anxiety from my heart through my face. And I got a little bit lightheaded. So I take a seat for a second facing the way that we came from. I'm just trying to gather myself for a moment, but I could see the entrance to the pathway where we saw the fool's gold in the distance. And like I said, we were on a slight incline since we left that passageway. So we almost had a bird's eye view of where we came from. I see a little bit of movement right near the passageway. So I immediately open my backpack that I was originally opening to grab my water, but I reach past my canteen for my binoculars. And Abdullah's just behind me playing up the bit. He's just distracting the guy doing an all out photo shoot near the protruding columns. So I have a moment to investigate this. I planned on creeping on whoever was in that passageway and then using the binoculars to search for our next clue. Well, the guide was preoccupied with Abdullah taking photos for IG. So I put the binoculars up to my eyes and I'm trying to find the source of the movement. And I realized that I could see the top of the ledge where that boulder had come from. And I scanned it until I came across a man. He was just standing on that ledge, looking directly back at me. He just looks like an average guy, but there's something a little bit off about him and it hits me. This guy's not wearing hiking gear. He's just dressed like a regular guy. So I'm just staring at this odd man and he's staring right back at me. But there's no way that he's actually staring at me because he doesn't have binoculars on. So I removed the binoculars from my eyes just to be sure. And without the binoculars, he looks like a tic tac in the distance. I can't see this guy at all. I can't tell which way he's looking or even that he's a man in the distance. So I put the binoculars back to my eyes and this time he slightly tilts his head and raises his eyebrow as if he was aware that I had put the binoculars back on him. And I start to get a horrible feeling in my stomach and another way of anxiety through my chest and face when he lifts his hand up and waves at me but he did one of those Miss Universe waves where they just cup their hand and twist their wrist really delicately. My stomach drops at this point, but I can't take my eyes off of him. And I watched this man just put his hand back down at his side. And it looked like he was preparing to start doing a backbend. He put his chin up to the sky and reached both of his hands over his head. Like he was going to start standing on his hands and feet while arching his back. But as his torso kept falling backwards, his legs didn't move and his torso collapsed to the floor as if he split in half at his belt line and his legs were just standing where he was standing. I start having heart palpitations at this point and I start to feel cold. I can't believe what I'm looking at and right before I'm about to call to the others, the two legs that were remaining standing just took off running to the left. They were just two human legs sprinting the edge of a mountain. I lost them after about two seconds, so I panned back to where the torso fell. And this thing is in a full handstand. 
and it just launches itself off the ledge of the wall. Once it left the ledge, I just pulled the binoculars away from my eyes to save myself from seeing the impact. But I'm in total shock at this point. So I whip my head towards the guide and Abdullah and I make concerned eye contact with the guide. At the moment, I had no idea how to explain what I just saw, but he could see that something was wrong by the look on my face. But he jumped to the conclusion that I might be having a heat stroke and just started giving me water and started guiding me over to the shade of the columns. I'm having this massive internal conflict because I don't know how to tell these guys what I just saw. Not to mention that I saw somebody on top of the ledge where the boulder fell, where the guide had initially suspected foul play. I kept getting these waves of cold flashes, but the guide just kept reassuring me that if I keep drinking water, I'm going to be okay. So I was just slowly sipping the water that the guide had put an electrolyte packet into. It took almost 10 minutes before the cold flashes stopped. I must have looked really bad because the guide was treating me like somebody who really needed help. And I finally get a couple words out. And I just said, I think I saw something over there. And the guide just reassured me that mirages and hallucinations are very common in the desert, especially when somebody's experiencing heat stroke. But I didn't know if that was a mirage. I thought mirages were supposed to be pools of water and fruit trees, not a pair of legs sprinting on a mountain and a torso taking a leap of faith. As I started to feel better, I realized that I hadn't taken a sip of water since the first rest stop. I didn't even take a sip at the second rest area or after we ran up this hill. I asked the guy to just give me a couple more minutes and I'll be fine to keep moving. And he took that opportunity to go look in the direction that I had said I saw something a couple meters away from me and Abdullah. And instead of checking on my well-being, Abdullah told me in an excited manner that that was a good move because it gave him time to scout the area. He thought that I was completely faking it so we could linger at the top of this hill. And insecurely, I pretended that that was exactly what I was doing and that I was fine the whole time. I only went along with it because I didn't want him to be worried about me. And after taking down that first bottle of the electrolytes, I felt 100% better. Even though I wasn't sure if I had just been hallucinating from dehydration, part of me just didn't want to be a liability to the group or for them to think I was the weak link. I don't know. It was super insecure of me. But Abdullah continued talking. He peeked over my shoulder to make sure the guide was still looking off into the distance. Then he pointed further north towards the next hilltop and said, can you see it, dude? And right there, almost to the top of the next hill, there was a clear arch on the left side of that hill that you wouldn't be able to see from the main trail. And this arch was clearly the shape of an eye. And it hit me. The Dutchman's words go through my head again. Through the eye of the arch, if you look through, you will see my mind. A rush of adrenaline goes through my veins instead of a cold flash. We are going to find this thing, but how are we going to convince the guide to take us to that next hill? Because there's no way that he's going to go further off trail just for the sake of some Instagram pictures. I'm starting to mull over the options of parting ways with the guide, but Abdullah speaks up before I do. We had just been talking excitedly and I reassured him that I'm feeling 100%, but Abdullah tells the guide that he thinks that we should camp here tonight. He says, I don't think Doug's ready to continue hiking. And even though I was feeling insecurities about being the weak link, that angle was genius. It was the perfect opportunity to stay at this clue and convince him to go to the arch on the next hill early the next morning while we have the whole day ahead of us. The guide looks at me for my opinion on the situation and I put on a puppy dog face and I say, I think I'll be good by morning. I saw a slight twinkle in the guide's eye that he had an idea that something was up, but I tried to barrel over that twinkle by asking if he had a second electrolyte packet. It seemed to work. So we start to set up camp on top of the hill in between the pair of columns. As the sun started setting and our camp was built out, we started to eat and chat and everything felt kind of normal again. Since we had to wait for morning to do anything, there was no mind games to play or no clues to look for. So we all got to relax for a minute. We had pitched our tents in between the two columns and lit our fire about 10 feet in front of the entrance to our tent. We were all fed and rehydrated as we started to wind down and it started to become night. It's really weird how dark and quiet the desert is at night. The sky is completely illuminated with stars, but without the fire, we wouldn't be able to see a foot in front of our faces. The only sounds that we could hear are like small insects an occasional breeze and a small crackling from the fire. We're all starting to get drowsy, so we all start talking less. You could tell that we're all just about ready to hit the sleeping bags. And let me tell you, there's nothing quite as exhausting as spending your entire day hiking in a blazing desert. I could feel my eyes starting to get heavy as we're walking towards the tent. But as we're about to climb in, we start to hear something that sounds like a major crackle in the fire. It doesn't sound like it's coming from the direction of the fire that's right behind us. We all look at each other a little bit confused when we hear it again, and it's definitely coming from in front of us. And we all stay extra quiet waiting to hear it again. And it only takes a couple seconds until we hear two back to back. And it sounds like it's getting louder and closer. We hear another one, but this time it sounded like somebody slapped two bricks together. Not just a crackle in the fire. These pops keep happening, but we could see no sign of the sound. At this point, we all walk up to the edge of the hill and we're looking down in front of us towards the main trail. We hear another one, but this time we see a little flash coming from the source of the sound. It just looked like a flash of a firework in the distance. And they keep 
keep going off and they keep getting closer. From our perspective, when we're looking at the main trail, the flashes are coming from the right side, but each one keeps getting closer to the middle. By the time it gets in front of us, right about where the trick in the trail was, the flash of this thing barely illuminates the source of it. And we realize it's a man unloading a pistol into the air and he's shouting. He's not even saying any words. He's just making mindless sounds and sending shots into the sky. I start looking around, grabbing my binoculars to try to get a closer look for the next time he shoots. And he gets illuminated again, but I'm scanning the darkness and he's fading off to the left. He must have reloaded because he let off quite a few simultaneously while he was letting out a really loud shout. And I'm finally able to get him in the sights of my binoculars as he does it. This man is ass naked jogging the main trail, just firing his pistol into the sky in the middle of the night in a desert. He's a drawn out older man with no clothes or shoes on. And he's got a beard and a haircut that covers almost his whole head. He just keeps going, shooting into the sky until he fades out of earshot and eyesight off to the left. I look back at the guide and he's already looking at it, but he has a really funny look on his face. And almost as if he's trying to hide the true intention of his following question, he flatly says, did you see it? With no details of what it was. I'm already super suspicious, so I say, well, that depends. What did you see? He seemed really frustrated with this answer and it confirmed my suspicions. He was only going to tell us what he saw if I had seen it too. But he replies with something that doesn't really make sense to me. And he just says, I saw the hermit. Abdul is super confused, so I just sarcastically reply. So by the hermit, you mean you saw a man ass naked unloading his pistol into the sky, right? You could see the tension between us and what I said clearly got under his skin. And he finally said what he truly felt. You know this is all happening because of you guys, right? And me and Abdullah look at each other like, oh, here, here comes the truth. He seems like he's finally angry enough to speak from his heart and spill all the beans. And he starts with a series of questions. Do you guys know why the Smoky Mountains are called the Smoky Mountains? Because of the notorious smoky clouds that cover their peaks. Do you know why Apache Mountain is named Apache Mountain? Because Apache lived there. Do you know why Buffalo Valley is named Buffalo Valley? Because the sheer amount of buffalo that roamed there. Why do you think these mountains are called the Superstition Mountains? Do you think it's a coincidence? Me and Abdullah have had it up to here with this guy. And Abdullah replies, wait, I thought these were called the Pyrite Mountains. Because all the fake gold is here, right? And I pile on. I go, no, wait, I thought they were the Hermit Mountains. Because of the Hermit Crab we just saw shooting his gun into the sky. The guide claps back immediately with, they should call these the Dipshit Mountains because all of the dipshits like us that come here searching for a mine that doesn't exist. And I go, oh, it's us now. As in us, all three of us looking for the mine. At this point, I know I have him backed into a corner and I could see in his eyes that he's about to change the direction of his argument. He takes another one of those deep breaths like he did at the second rest stop, ready to peddle us more lies to scare us. He goes, you guys promised me that you weren't looking for it anymore and I wanted to believe you, but the hermit only comes out when he knows that somebody's looking for the treasure that he thinks is rightfully his. I'm entertained by this dude's lies at this point. So I just gaslight him and I condescendingly say, yeah, yeah, and who is this hermit? And he says in a much more serious tone, who you just saw is Alicia Rivas and you're gonna end up just like him if you don't start listening to me. There's no way that this guy is about to start to tell me that the guy that I just saw running through the desert is the ghost of the man that he was telling us about earlier. I decide it's time to light a fire in this argument. So I just say, Admit it. Admit that you want us to leave so you could go find the gold for yourself. It's not like we could stop you. You're the only one with a gun here. That set everything off and it just becomes a circle of accusations of him calling us liars about our intentions and us calling him fake for not just wanting to split it three ways. It got heated to the point where as a collective, we had forgotten that a man just ran past our camp naked and unloading a firearm into the sky until we hear a sound on the other side of our campsite. And this sound clearly resembled like somebody running over rocks and pebbles. Even though we were all arguing, we knew that we were all sane and the man that we saw was clearly unhinged. So if he's near our campsite, we need to stick together. So we hustle back to the columns near the campfire so we could have as much light as possible to see him approaching. We were all scanning the darkness on the outside of the circle that our fire illuminated for any signs of this man. It was quiet for almost a minute to the point where I felt like it might almost be a false alarm until we hear it again. It sounded like a quick short run that skid to a stop only about 20 feet away from us, but we couldn't see a thing past that ring of light. We knew that something was there at this point and knowing that this guy was wheeled a weapon kept our adrenaline at its peak, but we're just stuck waiting at this campsite, waiting for him to run through the barrier of visibility. But he's just scurrying from left to right every couple minutes. This process just kept going on and on. Sometimes he would scurry so close to the ring of light that a couple of rocks would get tossed onto the campsite from what sounded like him skidding to a stop. Every time he would get close, the next time he would scurry and it sounded like he went a little bit further back. It was almost like he was teasing us. 
because he knew that we couldn't see him. After what felt like an hour of this dreadful anticipation, I remember that I have a flashlight in my backpack. So I take it out and I'm ready to turn it on, but I don't want to turn it on too early so that he knows we have a further range of visibility. So I whisper to the guys that I'm going to wait for him to get close. And when I shine the spotlight on him, somebody needs to hit him with something. We can't let this guy think that we're willing to be victims. We have to out crazy him. And there's three of us. So I think that we could scare him off. We decide that the best game plan is for me to shine the light on him and Abdullah to throw a piece of wood from the fire, a piece of wood that's only lit at the top like a torch and just throw it directly at him. So even if it misses, it illuminates the area near him just so we could see if he has his weapon drawn because the guide wasn't willing to shoot unless we could confirm that it's him and that he has his weapon out. So we wait what must have been like 15 more minutes until he skids to a halt right out of our line of sight and a couple rocks come flying into the campsite again so we know he's right there. So I aim my flashlight directly at the source where I think that he's probably standing and I just turn it on. I don't know why I thought that this flashlight was going to illuminate his whole body like it was one of those big helicopter flashlights because it didn't, but it extended our line of sight about five more feet, and we were able to see his shoes and the bottom of his pants. Something felt really off about what I was looking at, but I can't put a finger on what it is, and Abdullah does not hesitate. He takes a full baseball skip and launches this torch at him as hard as he can. And when the torch leaves his hands, we could tell that this thing is going to be a direct hit. And it seems right on course to hit this guy directly in the chest. I could still see his shoes and he's not reacting to the torch in the air. And I start mentally bracing for impact. As this torch is rotating in the air, closing in on this guy, the flames of the torch start illuminating his legs more. Inch by inch, we could see more of his pants. First his knees, then his hips, and now it's only a couple of feet away from colliding right to his chest. It's only a couple of feet away and the man still hasn't moved, and we still can't see his face. And then it hit me. The man that we saw was naked, and this torch glides right through where his chest should have been. And it's right above these illuminated legs, and you could clearly see that there is no torso attached to these legs. The torch just goes sailing over them 30 feet into the distance, because it didn't make impact with anything. As the light of the torch starts to fade off of the legs, right before it goes completely black, the legs take off sprinting to the left. I feel a sense of panic in my soul that I've never experienced before. My initial thought is that I'm hallucinating again, but when I swing my head to look at the other guys, I know that Abdullah saw exactly what I saw. I have no time to fill them in that I saw this pair of legs while we were setting up camp because the guy didn't even look at us. He flat out said, pack your essentials and run. I knew that this guy was full of lies when it came to the gold, but what we just saw was completely unrelated and unimaginably horrifying. You could peddle lies, but you can't fake the fear that he had on his face. So we just start shoving our essentials back into our backpacks and just take off running to the right, away from the direction that we saw the legs run. Instinctually, that was the correct direction to run, but I didn't make the decision based on instinct. I made that decision because I knew the archway was in that direction. And guys, I'm only telling you this to be transparent. In retrospect, I'm very ashamed of this train of thought. I don't know what came over me in those mountains, but when I saw the hermit running down the trail, the first thing that I thought was, at least he's not going in the direction of the mine. When I was arguing with the guide, all I was thinking was how can I get this guy to leave? So we only have to split it two ways. And when we were packing our bags to run from whatever those legs were, the only thing that went through my mind was to run to the right because that's where the arch was. When we start running, I was ahead of Abdullah and the guide, but I could hear them both running behind. I could faintly see the arch ahead of us because the desert was just starting its morning glow. And my only intention was to be the first one to the arch. I didn't even look back to see if they were okay. As long as they were in earshot, that was enough to keep my conscience clear, to be just far enough ahead of them to be the first one to the next clue. In all of this chaos, the clue was still my first priority, and I only stopped to turn back to check on my friends when I was five feet from the arch. I had been using my flashlight to point directly in front of my feet to see where I was running so I didn't twist an ankle. And when I turned around to point it back at my friends, expecting to see them running side by side, they were a little bit further back than I thought they were, and I had to wait for them to jog up into my spotlight. I gave my flashlight a quick shake to get their attention as they were getting closer to the spotlight. And when I stopped shaking it and held it directly on them, I realized it wasn't them. Just about five feet away from me, what I thought was the guide in Abdullah was the legs and the torso jogging side by side in unison. They ran up to the spotlight and stopped in a complete halt and the torso was in a full handstand and it had its back towards me. But the legs belt buckle was facing me. For some reason, the way that it stopped right in my spotlight, I had this feeling that it was trying to tell me something. 
and I didn't have that fear that I had initially. I almost felt defensive of the arch behind me, less in fear of my safety and more in fear of this thing knowing that the thing behind me is the third clue. As I'm standing there just staring at this split anatomy, the legs almost hop in a cartwheel fashion and reconnect to the bottom of the torso, but it's backwards. The back of the torso is facing me, but the front of the legs are facing me. As it finishes cartwheeling with its back still to me, the thing's back was facing me and its toes were facing me. And just like it did on the ledge when I was watching it through binoculars, it reaches its hands up over its head and starts to go into a backbend. As it starts falling into the backbend, its hair that was covering its face starts revealing it due to the gravity of finishing the backbend. It was so confusing what I was looking at because he was in a backbend, but the features of his face were upside down. His eyebrows and eyes were on his chin. His nose is upside down and his mouth is on his forehead. So his head is upside down in a backbend, but his face is looking at me as if it's in an upright position. And this thing has a maniacal smile filled with gold teeth. The only way I know how to explain it is like looking at a contortionist that copy and pasted his face upside down. And we're just staring at each other. But again, I still have this feeling that it wants to tell me something. So we both just stand there motionless until it starts talking. And all it says is, you're at the arch, but he's at the mine. And it starts to chuckle before it says, I wonder if he'll look for you before he goes in. And it erupts into laughter before it kicks off its feet into a full handstand again. And it takes off running away from me into the darkness on its hands at full speed as if it's sprinting on its feet. And I just see this upside down face with a piercing gold smile staring at me until it fades into the darkness. And a wave of rage washes over me. Not fear, not worry for my friends or for my own safety, but pure rage. So I immediately turn around and run up to the arch and stand in the center of it. I look to the right and I could see Weaver's needle from inside this arch, so I know this is the right one. I look into the other direction and I start to look down into the valley, and I'm just scanning for movement. It takes a few minutes, but the morning glow is getting brighter by the second, so I turn off my flashlight and it almost helps me see better, because just a few moments later, I start to see some movement right at the bottom of the hill. I could tell it's Abdullah by the way that he's walking in the shape of his backpack. I just stand up there watching him for a few minutes. I could tell that he's not trying to hide or trying to run, and he's not calling out for me, so he's not looking for me but he's definitely looking for something. He purposely split up from me to look for the mine because he knew that I was gonna run to the arch, but he had the foresight to run to the valley below because he knew it must be on the opposite valley of Weaver's Needle. So this guy's trying to beat me to it. I'm seething with rage at this point, but I just keep watching him for a hint of reassurance to tell me that I'm right about his intentions and I get what I'm looking for. It's getting even brighter at this point and I see him stumble across a ditch that's in the shape of a funnel. And I remember the Dutchman's last clue. He said, my mine is shaped like a funnel, not a doorway. And I watch Abdullah discover the funnel mine. And instead of celebrating and calling out for me, he ducks behind a boulder and starts peeking around, seeing if anybody spotted him finding it. But he didn't look up. He didn't see me see him. And I knew without a shadow of a doubt that he wasn't even trying to split it two ways. I don't know what came over me, but I start descending the hill ready to confront him. The only thing running through my mind is anger and betrayal. I sneak up behind him and I stop on the opposite side of the funnel mine from where he's hiding with his back to me. And I just blurt out, look at you hiding. I knew you wanted it all to yourself. I definitely scared him because he basically jumped when he turned around. But he replies, what are you talking about? Where is that thing? But I just keep following up with accusations. You weren't looking for that thing a minute ago. You were looking for the mind. Why are you worried about it now that I caught you? He starts defending himself saying that he was looking for me and he just happened to stumble across it. And I tell him, I was watching you. If you were looking for me, you wouldn't have been staring at the ground on the hillside. I see a tingle of fear in his eyes and he looks me up and down and he just says, Doug, calm down. What are you planning to do with that? I don't even know what he's talking about. About, so I look myself up and down. And in my right hand, I have my flashlight, but in my left hand, I'm gripping a jagged rock. I don't even remember picking this rock up on the way down, but in the moment, I was happy I had it. And right as I'm about to take a step towards him, we hear the guide's voice to our right. It's like he came out of nowhere. And all he says is, don't you see what it's doing to you? Don't you see what it's doing to us? And when I look at him, he just has tears running down his face and he starts pleading. And he says, I'm begging you guys, this isn't you. This is what these mountains do. Please guys, can't you see it? Can't you see the clues everywhere? We're just looking at him in silence and he just starts pointing around to the hilltops. And he just continues, don't you guys see the other columns? Don't you see the other arches? They're literally all over this mountain range. You could see Weaver's Needle from every arch. There's columns on every hilltop. 
There's hundreds of piles of stones that look like old stone houses. People have carved thousands of men into the rocks as fake clues. And they've dug countless funnel mines in search for the gold. You could find these clues in every square inch of the mountain range. I'm begging you, do not end up like them. Don't throw it all away for fool's gold. None of what he said is getting through to me. I'm as angry as I was when he started talking. But the only thing that snapped me out of it was his last line. Just go look inside and let me help you get home. I look back at the funnel mine and I immediately go into it feet first. You have to slide in feet first and then you enter a cavern. When I get inside, I turn my flashlight on and I take a swing at a protruding edge with the rock that I have in my hand. And I chip off a piece of the wall to see if there's anything inside of it. And there's nothing. There's no gold bits and the cavern's only five feet long. It's empty. There's no gold in sight. And I feel shame wash over me. I feel deeply embarrassed for the way I acted. And I just drop the rock and climb out of the mine. We all just look at each other with no words and I just shake my head signifying that there was nothing in there. The sun is almost fully up at this point and the guy just starts walking from where we came from and we just shamefully follow him. There were no conversations or jokes or laughter on the hike out, just an overwhelming sense of shame. We didn't stop the whole way back because it was still early and moderately cool and none of us seemed to want to extend this trip any longer. When we finally arrived back at the parking lot and we were ready to part ways, the guide finally broke the silence. He still had tears in his eyes. All he said was, I'm so happy I was able to get you guys out. You both have good hearts and you didn't deserve to die in those mountains like the rest of them. He gave us both hugs like he really meant it and me and Abdullah both gave each other hugs too because our actions out there weren't a good representation of how much we cared about each other. We start walking back towards our car and there was another car in the lot with three friends unpacking their trunk. They were looking so excited. They looked like they felt exactly how we did when we first arrived. As we're walking past them, I noticed that they're looking at a hand-drawn map, clearly reminiscent of the treasure maps that we saw online before we came. I knew exactly why they were here and I knew I had to say something, but I didn't have the energy in me to give them an enthusiastic warning. So in passing, as they asked us how it was out there, all I was able to say was, if you guys want to enjoy your time out there, leave the maps and the clues in the car. I could tell they didn't like my energy and I just said, trust me as I was walking away. And to this day, I wish I said more. Me and Abdullah get into our car and we just sit in silence for a moment before we start apologizing to each other. I tell him how sorry I am for the way I acted near the mine and that I don't know why I jumped to those conclusions or why I grabbed that rock. And he said something I'll never forget. He said, you were right to jump to those conclusions. I don't know what came over me, but everything that you said you saw was true. I did run away from you and I was trying to hide the mind from you. I don't know why I did it. Didn't even feel like it was me doing it. And right then, I knew that we experienced the same thing out there. We were consumed by it. We were consumed by the thought of unimaginable wealth. And there was something seriously wrong with those mountains. Something was wrong with those mountains when you went in there with the wrong intentions. And as we're driving away, we drove past that group of guys one more time. And the guide must have been putting on his customer service front because it looked like he had already changed into clean clothes. And he had the same excited facial expression that he had on when we arrived and he was just chatting with the new adventurers. I realized that he saved us and he deserved more of a thank you than we gave him. We drove all the way home and we let a week pass before we even talked about it again. And me and Abdullah both agreed that it was the right thing for us to try to find the guide's phone number so we could call him and thank him properly. So we went to the Superstition Mountains website and as we were searching for the contact information, we saw a big missing persons report on the front page. And it was those three guys that we saw in the parking lot with a message at the bottom asking anybody to call in with any information, anything that anybody might have about their whereabouts. We had to call and we ended up getting on the phone with a woman and we told her that we saw them in the parking lot with the guide before we left. And she said something very interesting. She said there's no active guides on duty there because of the COVID restrictions, but we assured her that we had hired a guide the day that we were there. She asked us his name and when we told her, she stuttered and she replied that we must be a little confused. She thanked us for the information, but then she told us that we should probably Google that name because we must be mistaken. So we open a new tab and we Google the guide's name and we find his Instagram. We start going through his pictures and it's clearly him. It's definitely the man that we spent an entire day with and all of his photos are from different hikes and adventures. So we didn't get what she meant until we checked his most recent picture. His last post was a selfie of him arriving for a hike at the Superstition Mountains, but it was posted in 2018. So we go back to the Google search page and we scroll down a few tabs and we find an article written about this guy from 2018. The article was an obituary and it read that he went missing in the Superstition Mountains in October of 2018 and they had found his body at Weaver's Needle two months later. But we saw him. Me and Abdullah spent an entire day with him and he's the reason we got out. This man literally talked us out of turning on each other and he led the way out of the park. I don't know if anything that I saw there was real. The hermit, the legs, or even the fool's gold. 
the only thing that I know is that that guide saved us. And there's things that happened in that mountain range that I cannot explain. Hey guys, I hope you really enjoyed this story. We put a lot of effort into it. I'm really enjoying dropping these on a weekly basis. We're going to try to drop them every Monday for you. If you enjoy these stories, please like, subscribe, comment. It helps more than you could possibly imagine. We're trying to get to a million subscribers by the end of this year. The thing that helps us the absolute most is if you click the join button below and join the exclusive membership, it helps a thousand. It helps 3,000. Or you could go to DougieCarado.com and grab a piece of merchandise. I love you guys and I'll see you next week.